In the previous two episodes of this series, I showed you how I stripped this four-drawer chest in the flowover tank. In the second episode, I showed you how I went ahead and did all the sanding and prep work for finishing. Now our client picked a deep cherry as the color for this piece. So in this episode, what we're going to be doing is we're going to finish this piece in deep cherry. And it's going to be quite the interesting episode. I think you'll enjoy it. Now something that might jump out at you real quickly on this piece um, is the unevenness in the wood tones on the drawer fronts. You have sap wood and you have light and dark areas. And that is going to be the unique aspect of the finishing on this particular piece. Now I think it's fair to say when we discuss finishing and coloring of wood, we think of a stain as being one of our first steps, right? We, we apply color through stain. On this piece, I'm not going to use stain whatsoever. And because of these uh, color variations in the wood is, is generally the reason why. Also the color that I need to go to. Um, so for those reasons, I chose to use no stain at all. And my first step is actually going to be just sealing the wood with clear finish. Now the finish that I'm using on this piece is pre-catalyzed lacquer. Uh, now pre-catalyzed lacquer, and I'm using this as my sealer coat, pre-catalyzed lacquer is a uh, self-sealing system. So what I generally will do is you use the same finish throughout your entire finishing process, but in the sealer coats, I'll usually cut it about 50% with lacquer thinner. And so that's what I'm applying here. I'm apl applying a uh, basically a thinned down version of my standard pre-catalyzed lacquer that I'm going to use. Now I've applied two coats of my diluted lacquer, which you will often hear me just refer to as my sealer coats. And after allowing that to dry for a few hours, I'm able to go ahead and sand it. So I'm using the orbital sander um, and I'm using 320 grit sandpaper. Now I'll go through, I'll use a few pieces of sandpaper here because I'm only allowing this lacquer to dry for a few hours. When you kind of push it through a little bit quicker like that, um, sometimes you'll get a, it'll take a little bit more sandpaper because the sandpaper will clog up a little bit. Um, you let it dry a day or two if you have that kind of time. Um, you'll use a few pieces less sandpaper, but my hourly rate is more expensive than a piece of sandpaper, so I'll just swap it out a few times. Now when I'm using the orbital sander like this, you'll notice that I'm careful of not putting my pad about 50% over the edge. Uh, if you go more than 50% over the edge with your pad, you're gonna lean over the side a little bit and you tend to burn through the edges um, and sand through, especially if you have stain on your piece, you might sand through the stain on the edges. So don't put that pad more than about 50% over the edge of that top. Now to sand the drawers um, on the faces, again, I'm using 320, just a piece of sheet paper. Um, I'll sand those and, you know, just clean it up a little bit, um, get, get rid of all the little burrs. And to do the framework, I'm using a gray Scotch-Brite pad. Now I'll put links down below um, so that you can see the products that I'm using. Um, so if you look down in the description, there'll be links for all of these different types of products. Now the gray Scotch-Brite pads are great right in this situation because I'm not going to sand through. So it, it smooths it out real nicely, gets rid of all the little burrs and the roughness, but at the same time, um, it's not like sandpaper where I'll cut through a lot of the sharp edges. So uh, I use them a lot and I'll use them on chairs and chair rungs, just a real popular item in my shop. You see me using um, the gray scotch bright pads a lot in finishing. Now when I do the edges here um, on the top, I'm able to just again use a piece of 320 sandpaper. So, so far we've put two coats of sealer on and we now have sanded the whole piece with 320 sandpaper so it's nice and smooth. I'm going to blow it off here with the uh, air hose. Um, you can use a tack cloth as well and get all a lot of that sanding dust off of the piece so that we can 
apply our first finish coat. So now that I'm, I'm going to apply my first finish coat, um, the difference between my, my finish coat and my sealer coat is just simply that my finish coat is full strength. So I'm applying the same pre-catalyzed lacquer that I used as my sealer, but my sealer was diluted 50% uh, with lacquer thinner. I'm now applying a undiluted uh, version of the same finish. So I'm spraying full strength Sherwin-Williams pre-catalyzed lacquer and I'll, I'll apply a nice wet coat over the entire piece um, and give it uh, a nice base coat that I'll build off of to start doing all of my coloring. Now once I have this coat on, um, if you've been keeping track, we will now have three coats of finish and three coats of finish and still no color. <laughs> so yeah, when I'm using um, this type of system and I'm going to put all my color in my tint, I like to apply a few coats of, of clear finish first and it gives me a, a good clarity on the piece and I can better see what type of color that I'm going to need to use. So for this job, I'm going to start out with some universal tint colors and I'm using Van Dyke Brown and Yellow um, to start out with. And those are the colors that I'm going to use. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to shade in those light areas. So I'm using the uh, pre-catalyzed lacquer as my binder. So that's the liquid in my cup. And I'm adding universal tint color to the pre-catalyzed lacquer. Um, and I'll just do that with the colors that I feel that I need um, in order to get the color that I want. I'm also going to add in on this job a little bit of dye as well to my uh, my tint. I just wasn't really happy with just the uh, opaqueness color and I wanted to add a little bit more depth as well. So um, my tint color here uh, that I'm going to use for my shading stain is both, it's a combination of universal tint colors and dyes. So the dyes that I'm using here are yellow and amber. Now universal tint colors will not always fully dissolve um, when you put them in a binder like lacquer. So it's very important that you use a filter um, and strain it well when you put it into your cup gun. So then I'm just, I use a piece of white paper here and I'm going to adjust the gun um, because I'm going to be able to, I want to, I want to spray very fine detail here. So I'm not going to use an airbrush because I have way too much area to cover. So instead of using, um, instead of using an airbrush, what I'm using here is I'm using a touch-up gun, which is, you know, just a very small scale cup gun, you know, just a, just a finishing gun. So very slowly and methodically, I'll go over the front of this piece and just shade in all the light wood. It's kind of like, um, it's difficult to explain, but when you just mist on a color like this, it doesn't look the same as it's gonna look as when you put a clear coat on, because it gets kind of a little hazy and a little foggy, because you're almost really putting on, spraying like you're, it's like you're applying a, almost like an overspray, because I'm not spraying a heavy wet coat at all. I'm misting it on real softly. So it gives it a hazy look, right? And it's kind of deceives you a little bit, but all that will clean up when I put a wet coat of finish over top of it. Now my general goal here isn't to make these uh, variations in the wood grain, the shapes go away. What I really ought, I'm just trying to accomplish is having them all blend. Uh, right now, the way that they are, there's, you know, there's very stark differences in the the tones of the wood. What I want to do is I just want to make them a little bit more uniform. I still would like the contrast there. I, I want to see it. I want to be able to see, uh, you know, the different wood grains. Um, so I don't want to cover everything up so that, you know, you don't you just kind of mutes it all out with opaqueness. I'm just trying to blend them and feather everything together so it's more uniform. Um, 
that's why I'm doing it the way that I'm doing it. And that's why I chose earlier not to use stain. Stain would just make everything a different color, but it wouldn't blend anything together. It wouldn't make light wood match the darker wood. It would just make everything redder or everything darker or everything browner. Um, so that's why I chose to do this. So I, I'm sort of building my color through layers. Now learning uh, how to do shading like this, um, really it's the difference between, uh, you know, okay work, maybe not even okay, um, really lower quality work and upper quality work. And the difference between those really comes down to tinting and shading and understanding colors and understanding how to use different colors um, and different colorants um, in systems like this. Like this little block, for instance, on the leg. Um, if you, if I didn't understand and you don't know how to do shading like this and mix tints and mix them properly, um, you know, you just, somebody would, what they would do is they would muddy it up with some stain. Um, but this is a way of doing it and really getting a super professional look. So I've now gone over the whole piece and um, I've done all my shading, uh, shading round one, we'll call it. And I'm gonna hit it now with a second coat of pre-catalyzed lacquer. So this is my second finished coat. And again, from here on out, it'll be full strength pre-cat. So this will essentially be a finish, uh, our fourth coat of finish. And now once we apply this, we'll get a really good visual of where we're at as far as our coloring and how our shading worked out. So I'm applying a nice wet coat of pre-catalyzed lacquer and what it's showing me is that I'm happy with where I'm at with my first stage of color. So it did a nice job balancing the colors and blending them together. So I'm, I'm pleased with where I'm at right there. And that's going to sort of lead me into the next phase of coloring. Now for my, for my shading stain, you noticed I used a yellow brown. And that was, that's odd in a way because I don't want a yellow brown color, I want a red color. This client wants a very red finish. But I needed to use the same color as the wood tone that I was matching. That I accomplished. The next stage is to now shift that color over to the color that I want it to be. So red and blue dyes are going to be my next stage. So generally what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a purple tint. And the purple is going to be used to offset and neutralize the yellowish orange color that this cherry has. So that is where I think a lot of people sometimes mess up and get confused. Um, but we're gonna shift this color over. So I wanted to make it all uniform and all the same color. It didn't really matter to me what color that was, I just needed to match um, my first shading stain to the color tones of the wood. Now I wanna turn those color tones, now that we have some uniformity on the piece, and I wanna shift them over to the color that I want them to be. Now the trick that we use here to cancel out orange and turn orange to brown is use the use of blue. So blue is a very popular color um, in a professional finishing shop, at least in my professional finishing shop it is. And we use blue to offset orange. We, uh, we have a lot of clients that just, you know, they will specifically tell us they don't want any orange in this color. Um, so we're gonna cancel the orange out by using blue. Now I'm going to be looking to attain a deep red color, but a red that doesn't have as, as much orange in it. So I'm going to use blue and red um, to make purple. 
and that's going to be my next stage of coloring. So again, as always, um, we'll filter it, um, you know, use a strainer. And, you know, for one, it gives us a good idea of our color. We can see it against a white background. And, uh, but, it, you know, you want to, you always use a strainer when you're mixing colors. And now I'm just using a cup gun. So I'm using a conventional um, spray gun um, and, and a cup gun because I'm going to apply this uh, in a wet, but uniform coat. So this will be coat number two for my, but for my tint, but this will be my color shifting coat. So this is where I'm going to take the orange base that we have here and make it less orange. Now another spray gun that would actually work far better um, than the cup gun that I'm using in this situation would have been a gravity feed gun. And that's the type of gun where you have the cup on the top. Um, you know, I'm, I just didn't have a good one <laughs> at the time, it, you know. So I have them, but it, I, I, I used it for paint and I just didn't feel like cleaning it out. So I'm just using, you know, I have the, a bunch of these cup guns. They're just, you know, cheap cup guns. Um, for spraying colors and you just want to be careful when you're spraying the top that you don't touch the cup on the surface. I do this so much that I never do but I would imagine that if you didn't do this all the time um, you know you, you might do that by accident and that's where a gravity feed gun kind of comes in handy um, because your cup sits on top of the spray gun so you're less likely to sort of touch the surface um, especially like on a top of a piece um, when you're spraying it. Now you can see here that I'm achieving exactly what I want to. I'm darking it up a little bit, um, but what I'm really doing is just pulling that orange um, and making it more brown and more reddish brown um, to be exact, which is uh, exactly the, the goal that I set out for. So this was round two for the colorants. I'm going to go one more round yet with colors. So I've now done my color shifting. What I'm gonna do now is my final color and I'm going to use more dye. I'm going to use red and amber. And this is going to give me my final color. So the amber is the sort of the tricky part here, right? You could figure I was gonna use red because we're looking to get deep red cherry, and that's the color that um, my client picked. So the red is a given. Um, here I'm just looking at what color I have um, and deciding whether I need more tint yet. Um, the amber is the trick because the amber is going to bring back some of the warmth that I lost by putting the purple on. The purple kind of kills the warmth a little bit. Um, now I want to be able to control the warmth, and I want it I want to add some yellow, but I, but I'm I'm in control of my color, so I'm not going to live with the color that the piece wanted me to have. The the tones of the wood. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put it there because I want it there, and that's where the amber here kind of comes into play. I want to add a little bit of warmth, but I want it to be the color warmth that I want, not the color that the wood was just going to give me. So I didn't have to just live with that. I'm in total control here with my color. So we're using a strainer again. I have the color I want. It's going to be a deep reddish tone, but you can see it's, it's, it's a warm red.
So just using a cup gun, again, I'll just put a nice, even wet coat of, you know, tint color, which again, my, um, I might have failed to mention this, but your, your binder, you know, your, your, your finish uh, is just catalyzed lacquer. So that's what I'm using to mix my toners in, my tints. It's just a catalyzed lacquer um, with the trans tint color to add it. So therefore, these two um, coats of wet coats of tint, um, my shifting coat, and now my final coat, they're also included in our finish coats um, because they're, they're full strength finish coats just with some color applied. So at this, at this stage of the game, you can really see the final product kind of taking shape here. And you can see how that early on, um, that shading that we did to eliminate all that, those, uh, you know, light areas in the wood. Now you, it kind of makes sense now and it really starts coming together. Now, if I do 50 jobs, uh, I probably do 35 different coloring techniques, um, but this is a very, you know, standard type approach in our shop. Uh, you know, it, each job varies quite a bit, but just as a sort of as a general rule of thumb, this is a just a super straightforward technique that we use day in day out in our shop and how we go about doing coloring. A lot of times we're using stain, but on those times that we don't, um, this is the way that I'm going to do it. Now, we still do the same stuff, uh, these same techniques, even when we use stains. It's just that on this job, that wasn't the best approach. So you'll want to check out, you know, all our other videos and, um, you know, we'll keep this going and we'll keep showing you all different types of techniques and all different types of systems. And, you know, up every, we can all up our game with, uh, you know, more of a professional approach to furniture finishing. Now, after we've applied that last color of tint, um, we're spraying the whole piece with a nice wet coat of clear lacquer. And we're going to put a nice wet coat of clear lacquer on because we're going to do one more sanding before we do a final coat. So I need clear lacquer over top of my tint coat so that I can do a little bit of sanding. If you're going to do a lot of sanding, um, it's best idea to put two to three clear coats over top of any type of tint coat that you put on. But the sanding that I'm going to have to do um, on this job is very nominal. So I'm going to be fine just putting on one wet coat of lacquer uh, before I do my final sanding. Okay, so several hours later, once that lacquer dries, I'm going to wet sand uh, this piece. Now this is a trick that you can do if you're trying to speed up a finishing job. I couldn't use regular sandpaper um, and an orbital until the next day um, at best, but you can wet sand um, without the finish being cured. So as long as it's, not, it's just dry, um, I'm able to wet sand it. Uh, so it, it's just a, a way to speed up the technique and when we do this professionally it's all about time. So I'm able to wet sand here using sanding block, 600 wet and dry sandpaper, and some water and dish soap. Now with the insides of drawers on the pieces, sometimes I spray them, sometimes I don't. And it's really a, a job by job decision. I'm going to spray the insides of the drawers on this piece because I ran everything through a flow tank. And since I ran it all through the flow tank, it kind of requires me to, to sand the interiors of the drawers and put a finish coat on. If I hand strip them, um, I might not have, and I might have just taped them off um, and plastic, put plastic over them. And I'm sure you'll see that in other jobs we do that. 
this job, I went ahead and sprayed the interiors of the drawers. So we put one more final finish coat um, on the case now. So I'm gonna blow it off and clean it off with air, get any dust off of it because I want a you know, really clean coat. I went ahead and I sanded this piece and we're now going to go ahead and put the nice, a nice final finish on. So, um, you know, you wanna make sure it's nice and clean, use a tack cloth or, you know, a dry cloth or like I'm using um, air and make sure you get it nice and clean before we put that last beautiful finish coat on because this is the end of the job. Uh, unless we get a big piece of dirt in it. And if we get a big piece of dirt in it, then I gotta sand and spray it again. But uh, that's not gonna happen. Now you'll notice I've been spraying this piece up off of the ground. Um, I might put cardboard under it if I wasn't, um, but I'm using a hydraulic cart here and I'm able to just jack this up off the ground so that when I'm using uh, the sprayer, it doesn't blow dust up off the floor. You know, you try and clean the spray room, but I mean, we spray so many finishes through here that, you know, dust on spray dust on the floor is just inevitable, no matter how much it seems we, we sweep up. So, you know, getting pieces up off the floor or putting cardboard under the feet um, helps us not blow any particles up onto our finish and uh, gives us a better final finish and less sanding that we have to do each time. So as I apply the last coat of catalyzed lacquer here, it's going to sort of bring this whole job um, to a closure. This is the final coat. This coat will sit and cure for a day. And once it's dry, um, you know, she's ready to put back together and this job will be completed and we can go ahead and um, put the hardware on. So next thing we'll do is put the hardware on and call her a wrap. So now this hardware didn't take any effort, um, but we do have a great video on our channel for how to clean hardware. So be sure to ch check out our channel page um, and we have a lot of videos on there. We have a lot planned in the next year. We have big, uh, big plans. So if you're not already a subscriber, um, you know, make sure you, you subscribe and, and hit that like button and hit the bell button so you get the notifications. And I hope you really enjoyed this video. I know I enjoyed doing it for you. And you know, this piece came out tremendous. The customer was thrilled. She was so happy. So we're going to be putting out a lot more videos like this. Um, thanks for watching. We really appreciate it. We'll see you again soon. Um, we have a lot more new videos in the works. So, you know, y'all have a good day and God bless.